Greetings from Belgium. My name is Alice. I would like to take the time to tell you about a dogman encounter I had six years ago while visiting my brother's home here in Belgium. It was a very strange and terrifying experience for both of us. I am a 24 year old woman. My brother is 30 years old. When this happened to us, he was living in a small home several hours from our family. He had purchased this home to expand it for his bride and the family that they were starting. I was only 18 when this happened to us. I had decided to visit him for his birthday and drove through the forest to get there. I greeted his wife and we all shared dinner. It was a wonderful night to celebrate his birthday. Once we had finished dinner, his wife went to bed. You see, she was very pregnant at this time and tired very easily in those days. It was fine for us. We could just sit and talk and catch up. It had been over a month since I saw my big brother last. We were sitting on his patio in the backyard once night had fallen. It was a very nice night. Here in Belgium where we are, it doesn't get too warm. It was about 70 degrees or so. A nice night to sit outside and look at the skies. We were just talking about how excited my brother was for Anna to give birth soon when Simon remembered he had beer in his house that he wanted me to try. It was from a local pub and he swore I wouldn't be able to find it anywhere else and I would love it more than any other beer. Also here in Belgium, we take a lot of pride in our beers. That's why Simon was so excited about it. While he was inside, I really thought I heard something moving around in the forest. It was to the point where I got out of my seat and walked to the edge of the patio to look at what was causing the noise. When Simon came back, I shook the weird feelings away and we sat to enjoy the beer. And he was right, it was a very good beer. I'd have to stop by this pub and pick up some beer on my way home. We sat down to talk again as we both lit a cigarette and my brother told me he was going to name his son Arthur, after our late father who had passed away several years ago. But quickly, he stopped talking and started looking around. He had a very grim expression on his face, like he had seen a ghost. Watching him sent tingles down my back. He was acting very strange. He looked over at me and I could see he was becoming upset. I asked him what was wrong, but he only told me to wait there. He'd be back again. This time I did not get out of my seat. I was wondering if he had begun to hear the noises that I thought I did. No more than a minute later, he came back out with a rifle and sat in his chair again. Obviously. I wanted to know what was going on. All he said was it was for our protection, but he would not tell me what he was protecting us from, and he would not just go into the house where it was safe. We both heard the rustling sound again, but it was closer to us this time, and further over on the side of the house. I was frightened but unwilling to show this to my big brother, so I sat in the chair and just looked over where the noise was coming from. Simon would not take his gaze away from where the rustling sounded from, and he whispered to me, Alice, there's something here in this forest that you could not believe, even if I told you all about it. I thought it had left. It hasn't been here for many months. I wanted to know what it was, but he refused to say anything else about it, and would barely speak to me as it was. I could tell he was getting more frightened, though. Out where we were, it was very dark, and it was far away from parts of the city, so it was difficult to see. However, the moon was bright that night, and both of us could make the shape of something large moving around in the trees. It looked like it had the shape of a man to me. It was definitely moving around on two legs, I was sure of that. The silhouette of it was big and very tall. We both stood there, listening for something moving around the trees. It was making a snorting sound, very unlike anything I had ever heard in my whole life. I was very scared now. If it was a man out there, my brother would have just told me so. It also didn't sound like a man. I don't know what this thing was, but my brother seemed to have a history with it. I whispered to him to just tell me what it was, but all he said to me was, I'm sorry for putting you in danger. That thing out there is a beast. A monster and I do not know what it is or what it wants. He told me he had to scare it away to protect all of us. 
What he did next changed the way I look at the world, because he shined his light out into the woods, and the light hit this creature. It was like some kind of monster, like from werewolf movies. The first thing I noticed was how much like a werewolf it actually looked. It had very long arms, with a lot of defined muscles on them. The arms hung very low. They were past the waist, close to the knees. The hands looked very human. Fingers instead of paws, claws at the end of those fingers. It was covered in coarse black fur, but the fur on the chest was thin and I could see flesh underneath. It was a dark color. It had a very thick neck and broad shoulders that were also very muscular. The head was the scariest though. I've never seen anything so mean before. It had the muzzle of a wolf, pointed ears, and a very long, nasty mouth full of teeth. The eyes seemed to shine from the light. The face was just like the chest. It had thick fur, but also had visible flesh in some spots. The legs looked human. It looked flat-footed. And when it moved, there was no visible tail that I could see. When the light hit it, it made a very low growl. But then as the growl rose, it almost sounded like a roar. Again. The sounds that it made were like nothing my ears have ever heard. It sort of hunched down and stared at us for a second before it darted away from the light. Later, my brother told me that he didn't think it liked the light very much. Simon fired his rifle in the air, as if to scare it off. I was confused as to why he did not just shoot the monster, but later, as we talked about it, he told me that he didn't think a bullet would do any good. He grabbed my arm and dragged me into his home. He told me we could not go back outside for the rest of the night, and he began to look out of his windows one by one. Our noisiness had woken Anna, and she came into the hallway in a fright. It seemed, though, that she knew what was happening too, and my brother simply told her that it was back. She looked absolutely terrified. She told my brother that he had made a promise to her that this creature wouldn't come back. He apologized to her and told her that he was wrong that it did come back, but he would never let it hurt her or their unborn child. Then he kissed her forehead, and then kissed her swollen belly. The three of us spent the remainder of the night watching out of the windows. Occasionally, you could see a large mass moving around in the tree line. I knew it was that creature out there. It never came close enough to the house to get another good look at it. I was happy with this. I did not need to see that thing again in my whole life. Every once in a while, though, you could hear loud growling and roaring sounds from outside. I was terrified all night and thought that that thing was going to knock down the door at any given point and kill all of us. During the night, Anna made Simon promise to her that they'd move from this place. She didn't want their baby to be in danger. He kissed her forehead again and made that promise, telling her that they would move as soon as possible. He stayed at the doorway with his rifle the entire night. By dawn, all three of us were exhausted and we needed sleep, but it seemed none of us were willing to close our eyes long enough to even doze off. During the night, we discussed what it could be. A werewolf, a devil, a monster. We didn't have a name for it, but something told me that it was a werewolf. Just because it looked so familiar based off of monster movies that I have watched my whole life. Simon told us that it was no longer safe to be there, and by the light of day, we left their house. Simon went back days later with our cousins to remove their personal things before selling away the home. When they got there, the big door that led to the backyard was all scratched up like something was trying to get in. We hadn't heard the noises the night that we were there trapped by that beast. So my brother assumes that it was from another night, possibly even the night after we left the house. The man that he sold the property to, he was honest with. He told them that there was a beast that roamed the area, and he didn't think it was anything that we knew about. He believed that it was something evil, but he doesn't think that that man believed him too much. 
boy is he in for a very big surprise one day. Curiosity still plagued my mind though, for weeks after we had our encounter, and I eventually traveled back to the area that my brother lived in to ask the people that lived around him whether or not they had ever seen a creature like this. None of them had the misfortune of seeing it as we did, but there were several people who had lost animals mysteriously in the night due to something that they thought was big. They testify that it was big because of the noises that they heard outside. Deep growling noises and a roar that was so primal they couldn't describe it. I think that that's the same roar and the same growl that we heard that thing make that night. Anna went on to give birth to little Arthur and also two more daughters after that. I myself had had a son, and I am expecting our second child with my husband. We never went back to that land after I did my investigation. Simon made me promise not to dig too deep, just in case this creature was smart enough to track us down because we were trying to get too much information. I don't know if there have been any more sightings since then. I would like to put this behind me and get on with my life. There are monsters out there that hide in the darkness. I do not know what they want, but I know they are very real. Other things I remember from that night are the smells that I experienced during this encounter. At first, I smelled what I can only describe as that chlorine smell that you smell at a public pool. And then, when that creature was near, a very potent wild animal odor, like urine and dead rotting things. I had also mentioned before that this thing looked flat-footed, and after our exchange of emails, I want to elaborate on that. This thing was very proportionately the same as a man. The legs looked the same as a man. It did not stand on its toes. It wasn't digigrade as you referred to it. This thing reminded me of a man that had morphed into a wolf, just like you see in the movies. The hands and fingers of this thing were also very human-like, almost like a raccoon that looked like they were designed to actually hold on to things. I've read a lot of encounters where these creatures, whether it be a werewolf or a dogman, are capable of grabbing doors and trying to unlock them or open them. This scares me, because if it was smart enough to get in, then we could have died at any minute. I don't understand why it didn't just come in and kill all of us. Thank you for speaking with me about these things. Hopefully my story will at least inspire some other people to come forward with their own encounters. Maybe one day we'll figure out what these creatures are. Thank you. Sincerely, Alice in Belgium. When this happened, I lived in mid-Michigan. This is a very rural part. The part of Michigan that's flat farmland with large patches of forest, where the DNR is constantly receiving stories of weird animals. The latest are out-of-place big cats, jaguars and panthers to be specific. But that's not what I'm here to talk about, even though I wish it was. It began around the mid-90s, it was a warm summer when all this began for me, when I found out that there was definitely something unknown stalking the area around our land. My first encounter was in fifth grade. Before that, I was always really sick as a kid. I was never really outside very often before that, so I don't know if this thing was out there before that or not. But as I got older and stronger, I began feeling much easier with the outside world. On my parents' property, we have tons of feral cats, close to a dozen on any average. Of course, they all have kittens because they were feral, they weren't spayed, so they just had a lot of kittens. At the time, I had a big collie named Barney, who has sadly passed away since then. Barney absolutely loved to cuddle these kittens, 
regardless of their age. Meaning that some of the kittens would go into shock being stolen from their mother by this giant ball of love. So we had to go outside and get the kittens, give them back to their moms, and that usually was pretty easy, but not this summer, because a lot of the kittens would go missing. On the first day it happened was yet again another day where Barney had took some of the cats. So I went outside to begin to look for the little kittens. I got around to the back of the place by our barn, and around a hundred feet or so away, I could hear what sounded like snapping. Not like snapping of twigs, but like the snapping of corn stalks. I looked up past our barn, towards the fields by our house, and saw this huge black shadow. I could actually see the corn stalks swaying back and forth out of the way of this giant thing as it came tearing towards us through the field. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it wasn't anything good. I was absolutely frozen. I had never seen anything like the creature that came out of those corn stalks. I mean, I've watched spooky shows before, and I've always been interested in cryptozoology, but nothing prepares you for having an encounter with something like this. It was on four legs, and looked very similar to a wolf, but this was no wolf. The way it moved was more like the movements of a lion that you see in the zoo. It had very long, shiny, dark brown fur that was almost curly in some spots, and shaggy in others. But the legs had patches of lighter brown and even tan. It had very long ears that stuck up straight and had tufts of that same tan color at the tops of the ears. It had a muzzle that was shorter and bulkier than a wolf, which also made it clear to me that this was not a wolf I was looking at. Honestly, I didn't know what it could even be. My mind was racing trying to identify this unknown creature, and all I could think was how much it looked like a werewolf. And then I noticed the paws of this thing. They weren't paws at all. They looked more like hands. Where the toes of a dog should be were very defined, clawed fingers. Throw in the expression on this thing's face and I knew I was looking at something supernatural. It actually looked like it was scowling at me. Like I had pissed it off or something. I had never seen something look so wicked in all my life. Once the fear kicked in, and I decided to make a break for it, I ran full speed back to the house. By the time I got inside, my parents were almost as terrified as I was. They knew something bad had happened while I was outside. I told them that I saw something, and they began to question me. And they believed me. Because you see, they knew what I saw was real because a large unknown animal had attacked my mom while she was outside a few summers before that. Back when it very first started showing up. She said she'd run inside after feeling a very bad, ominous feeling, only to suddenly have a giant animal try to break into the front door. I asked her what it looked like, and to my horror, she described the same thing that I had just seen. She said it was huge, dark brown, looked like a wolf, only it had characteristics that she'd never seen on a wolf before. And when I asked her what she meant, she told me she could have sworn it looked like it could have walked on two legs, but she had to have been mistaken. She said it was also way too big to be a wolf, and the muzzle was wrong. But the scariest thing she told me was that when she was trying to keep this thing from breaking down the door, she could hear the doorknob moving, like it knew what it was used for. And I didn't really sleep too much that night, needless to say. And I could hear my parents moving around the house around two in the morning, so I knew they weren't sleeping either. Other than a lot of dogs barking that night, nothing much else happened. We made sure Barney was in the house that night too. Usually he liked to sleep outside, but I wasn't going to let him go outside with that thing around. Then, fast forward exactly two weeks later, Mom and I were both back outside. The same deal. 
missing kittens, and we were blaming our big cuddly dog. But some of them were just unaccounted for. This time though, we barely made it back to the door. My flashlight went past the barn towards the woods behind the house. A neighbor had an old derelict truck there, and horrifyingly I saw something standing beside it. I mean, it was standing just like a man, but it looked taller than the top of the truck. I saw these giant glowing eyes. I don't remember much about the color, but I want to say they were red or orange. It was like when the camera makes an animal's eyes glow, but it almost seemed like the eyes were doing it itself. I knew it was that thing because I could make out the same horrible features as I did before. And my mom was right. This thing could stand up on two legs. It didn't move from the spot by the truck though. It just kept looking in our direction. That's when I got the impression that it wanted to hurt us. And I realized just how big this creature really was. It looked like it was two or three times my size. It was like I was living in a scary movie and I was face to face with something that very much resembled a werewolf. I was so scared I couldn't look at it anymore. I remember turning away and my mom seeing me and then looking back in the direction that I was looking at. Then she suddenly grabbed me and we were racing back to the house as fast as we could. On the way back, I could hear the sounds of something loud running towards us from behind. And I was too scared to look back though. I was so panicked that I started shrieking. We got to the house and quickly locked the door. We made sure that we could put as much space between us and that thing as possible. We could hear it growling outside and even through the door, it was so loud. It was terrifying. We're talking pee your pants kind of scary. Barney was going crazy, clawing at the door, but there was no way in hell I would let him out. When my dad came downstairs, because of all the noise, we told him what happened. And when he went out there with his rifle, even though the two of us begged him not to, that thing was gone. We were always wary after that. Never went outside alone. Always used the buddy system. I used to have a room upstairs in the house, but after a while I started sleeping in the basement. One big factor for that move was because some nights I could hear crunching outside, like something heavy was walking around. And this would be followed by shallow breathing and low growls. And even if it wasn't my imagination, there was definitely something out there that was scaring the hell out of me. And those growls sounded just like the ones that were at my door. It was like something was standing right outside of the window. And then there were these screams coming from the woods. Something that still freaks me out to this day when I think about it. It's kind of like a kid screaming, but throw in some bass and make it a lot more feral. It would always get the dogs in the neighborhood barking, even though none of my neighbors were too close to each other. And this thing has this odor that can make your nose crinkle, like rotten lettuce and decaying possum. The smell of this thing comes far before the thing ever makes its presence known. I learned really quickly to be careful and wary outside. Just because we've developed society and civilization doesn't mean there aren't still things out there that we don't know about. Most of which, if you don't see it first, you'll never see it coming until it's too late. I'm an adult now, and sometimes I still catch a glimpse of this thing from time to time. The incident occurred in November of 2015, the week before Youth Weekend here in Vermont. I went out alone with my hatchet and machete and water, and that's about it. I thought myself a self-made survivalist, 
and I was either too young or too dumb to know any better. I didn't know how truly dangerous the wilderness could actually be. To set the stage for you, I was alone in 110 acres of woods. I stupidly chose to go to the thickest section. I walked out to an area of spruce trees that had a decent amount of deer activity, and once I got to the location, I got working on making my deer blind using deadfalls and spruce bows. I was making a lot of noise with my hatchet and cutting logs to make the three walls and the spruce bows. That's when I thought I heard a twig snap behind me. I stopped and slowly turned to see what had made the sound. When I turned around, I saw that I was still alone, although I did notice that the woods around me had gone unnaturally quiet. I was too inexperienced though to know that this was a bad sign, and again I stress how truly dangerous the wilderness can be. I went back to work, and the same snaps kept happening, moving around the side of me. That's when I heard this horrible growl that I will never forget as long as I live. It was like a snarl, like something was really mad. I turned, and I saw this huge creature with wolf-like legs that had claws or nails at least three inches long on the ends of them. I looked up, trembling as it stood there watching me, probably not even 15 feet away from me. It was the largest dog or wolf-looking thing that I'd ever seen. Its fur was dark brown and black. It had to be seven feet tall. Easy. Long arms and muscular legs, a head that looked exactly like a giant wolf, and these pure yellow eyes that just looked like it knew what it could do. It looked like a very intelligent creature. But what really disturbed me though was the way it had a human expression on its face. It was baring its teeth in this chilling looking smile. I was dumbfounded. All I could think to do was keep my eyes on it and slowly back away. I did exactly that. And then this werewolf looking thing did the same, mirroring my movements but coming closer instead of backing up. It only stopped when I made it to the edge of the woods. I don't know why it didn't follow me out, or why it didn't just end me when it had the chance, because it easily could have. It could have killed me at any moment. These days, I don't do my hunting or surviving out in those woods anymore. I would hate to come across that thing again, because honestly, I don't know if I'd be lucky enough to survive a second time. If you go out in the woods yourself, I don't recommend you go alone, unless you go well armed. This happened to me in Vermont, but we all know that these things are everywhere. I don't know what they want, but I do know that they look very intelligent, maybe even capable of conscious thought. So for the third and final time, and I hope you heed my advice, I want to warn you how truly dangerous the wilderness can be, because there are things out there that are made of nightmares. Supernaturalist, I am giving you permission to tell my story. First of all, English is not my native language, as you know, so there will be errors. Also, I don't think I'm a particularly good storyteller. Anyways, I would like to give you some background first. Swedish people are not particularly religious or spiritual. We are a bit pragmatic. We believe in what we can see, what we can touch. I know I'm generalizing here, but I think we have a little different culture than you do on the opposite side of the sea. The reason why I bring this up is because it applies to cryptids as well. Not until recently I knew about Dogman, Sasquatch, or anything like that. I stumbled across a YouTube channel that talked about Sasquatch. Until then, I more or less only heard about Yetis. I found that channel interesting, and one day there was this video about Dogman. I knew then that what I had seen all those years ago, and it was mind-boggling. I went absolutely cold on the inside, and just sat there, staring. Everything came back to me full force, and I forgot to breathe for a spell. I've never forgotten this creature. I remember it as if it was yesterday, and not 20-odd years ago. So this is what happened to me. 
You must know that I'm a dog breeder, and I have worked with dogs all my adult life. I absolutely love them. In my work, I also know all breeds. My encounter happened in wintertime. Some winters here can be harder than others. Colder, more snow, even longer. This was one of those winters. It had snowed for weeks, and it was so bad that you had to get up on your roofs to shovel snow. I live out in the countryside, and this day I had to go into town. I wasn't particularly looking forward to the drive. The rest of the year, I wouldn't think twice about driving that stretch. It usually takes me about one hour and 15 minutes. With all the snow though, it would take me that much longer. I left for town, and my work dragged on for a while. I didn't finish until early evening. After work, I went to see a friend. I was definitely procrastinating the drive home. It had snowed all day, and they were clearing the roads constantly. I wasn't worried about my dogs at home. My husband was there to take care of them. It was getting late though. My car had winter tires, and the car I drove was by no means a small car. Outside of town, there's just forest, more or less. I was driving on this country road, driving very slowly. I think only somewhere between 30 and 40 kilometers per hour. I was dead worried that I would skid and get stuck in one of the snowbanks, so I was being extra careful. There were snowbanks by the side of the road, and the ditch was deep in snow. The bigger roads in Sweden are fenced in with these fences that are approximately two meters high. This is to keep the wildlife off the roads. There were also snowbanks in the middle of the road. I know I go on and on about this snow, but it was exceptional weather at this point. I'd driven for about 10 kilometers when I saw something in my headlights. It was on the other side of the road coming towards me. First, I just thought it was the darkness and the snow playing tricks on my eyes. However, I slowed down more. I saw something moving and I remember that I was cursing the snowflakes because I couldn't see what was really there. Considering that there had not been any connecting roads for several kilometers, and there wouldn't be any more for about ten more as well, just forest, I was very confused, because to me it looked like some big animal was on the road. But then again, how could a big animal get out there? I saw that it was not a man, because it was something on four legs. I stopped and waited. I also switched to low beams as not to blind this animal. At first, I actually thought it was a moose. They are quite big, so I thought I would just sit tight and wait for it to cross. I didn't see it anymore, so I switched on the high beams again. And there it was, in front of me on the other side of the road. Only it wasn't a moose. It was some kind of dog. A huge dog. A dog that I couldn't identify. And remember, I know dog breeds very well. And this thing, this dog, was coming towards me. My heart actually broke for this poor creature. What was it doing out there? There was only forest and no houses, and it was covered in snow. What you should know is that we hardly have stray dogs in Sweden, so this dog must belong to someone. I was actually about to step out of the car when I saw it more closely. I never opened the door. That's not me. I would have gone through hell and back for a dog that I didn't know, but something just stopped me. I just watched it. It didn't walk, nor did it run. It kind of lumbered. It was not big. It was immensely huge. Big just doesn't do this thing justice. It had snow on its head between pointy ears and over its back. The head was very broad and the nose was long and odd looking. In hindsight, I'd describe it as a pig's nose. The fur was this brownish tan color and it was very shaggy. Thick on its body, but not on its legs. It had a weird gait when it walked, almost like it was swaggering. And also, it just didn't have the same proportions as a dog. The chest and shoulders and head were massive. I can't say much about the legs at all as I didn't think of looking at them. And this thing just moved so strangely. It also seemed absolutely oblivious to me, as if I wasn't even there. It just went past. 
It disappeared into the darkness behind the car. I just sat there, godsmacked. Never seen a dog like that before. I came to my senses and realized that I should still probably help it. It was a dog, right? I mean, what else could it have been? I had to drive a couple of kilometers before I was able to turn around. I drove towards town again and at some point I could see some indentations in the snow, but they all disappeared really fast since it was still snowing, and then it was gone. I went all the way into town but never found it. How did it get over all the snow, ditches, and fencing, I wondered. When I got home I contacted the police and made a report, as this was before I had a mobile phone. The following days, me and my sister drove around in that area, asking farmers if anyone was missing a huge dog. I described it as a mix between an Irish wolfhound and a Great Dane. I knew it was wrong, but what else could I say? I'd never even heard of a dogman then. But I remember what I saw. It's been with me all these years as something unexplained. Until now, at least. I'm glad I never found it. I don't think it would have ended well for me. If a man has a close encounter with a dogman, the dogman will definitely win. Please do not seek them out. We are the prey, not them. The way it moved was just unearthly. That's the story of my encounter with Dogman. Take care, Marie. Before I tell you about my story, I will tell you some background information about myself. I am not from the USA as you might think. I am from Europe, the Netherlands to be more precise. Normally, I don't believe in such things as werewolves or ghosts, which isn't common for a Dutchman. The Dutch are hard to convince of supernatural and mythical stuff like this. As for me, I love nature. Photography, drawing, and writing are my hobbies. When the first snow had fallen here, in the first week of January, I went to the woods by my house to take photos of the beautiful white landscape. I rode to the forest on my mountain bike. At the time, the sun would be setting in half an hour, so I had to take my photos quickly. Here, you're not allowed to be in the woods after sunset or before dawn, and you're not allowed to camp on the property. Each and every night the gates close at the same time, right after sunset. When I arrived, I chained my bike to a tree and went on walking and taking photos. All went as planned, except I took a bit too long and did not get out in time. The sun was already out of the sky when I came back and the forest was slowly coming to life. I saw a deer and a fox, but then I saw something else, something dark and big, and when I looked closer, I thought it was a wolf or a wild dog. It had bright yellow eyes and two sharp white fangs sticking out from under the upper lip. I saw the head from profile, but its body was almost a front view. It was then I could tell this was no wolf. It had a torso and the arms of a person, and the back legs, tail, and coarse fur of a wolf. It looked like it was listening, or looking for something. My heart seemed to stop, and I froze in place. I was completely and utterly petrified. This wolfman was no more than 30 meters from me. I hesitated whether to take a picture or just run away. But if I took a photo, it would be a once in a lifetime thing, so I chose that option. But the moment I raised the camera, this beast moves its ears, indicating that it heard me. Then it turned its head right towards me. At that moment, my whole body wanted to give out and I thought I was going to die. For the first time in my life, I felt a real, palpable dread. It had the most intense look I have ever seen. The creature stared right into my soul. At least, that's what it felt like. It came closer to me, but it was moving slowly, and it was on two legs. It was like it had never seen a human before. I knew how it felt. I had never seen anything like it before either. Except, I felt horrified and this thing seemed curious. It didn't act aggressive towards me, 
which was the only thing I could think of when I saw it. I thought for sure it would attack me and kill me, but it just came closer. I was still frozen, and I could not move. The beast now stood less than ten feet away from me and started sniffing the air, probably smelling my scent. I hoped whatever it smelled didn't suddenly change its mind and make it attack me. I would definitely be finished by then. By now, there was hardly any space between us, but this wolfman still did nothing. As quickly as I could blink, this creature jumped right at me, letting out a short and soft grunt, almost like a threat, but oddly enough, it didn't bear its teeth. I took a step back, and it took a step forward. By now, I knew it wasn't going to kill me, but it at least wanted me out of the woods. So I continued to walk backwards, facing it until what felt like an eternity later, when it finally turned around and ran back into the dark depths of the forest. It moved faster than a cheetah does, I think. It was faster than I could ever hope to be. I fell to the ground. I needed to sit. My legs were numb. I realized what I'd just seen. It was a werewolf, to put it bluntly. Just think, if that creature had been a little more hungry or a little more aggressive, I'd be dead and I wouldn't be able to tell you this story. After I got my legging, I stood up and ran back to my bike and unlocked it as fast as I could before that thing changed its mind and started to chase me. I raced back home and I looked through all the pictures I took, hoping that I caught a glimpse of the creature by accident on different pictures. There was nothing there though, so instead, while it was fresh in my mind, I decided to draw what I saw, and ever since then, I haven't been back to that area. I haven't really told anyone else this story. I don't think anyone else would believe me anyway, especially not in my skeptical family. Despite knowing that that thing does not want me there, I want to go back, and I plan on heading back there soon. Maybe this time, I can get that picture that I almost had. Hello, I have a story that I want to tell you. My name is William, and this is my first-hand account of the events that shaped my belief system. This happened to my family a long time ago, about 30 years now. I was only seven years old at the time, and my sister, who was nine, shared a room with me since we only had a three-bedroom house, and the third room was for our baby brother, who was only a few months old. I know that I didn't make this up, or imagine it, because my sister also heard the same noises as I did. We lived in an old cabin-style house out by the Daniel Boone National Forest, and if any of you guys are familiar with this place, you'll know that a lot of weird things happen here. We had a lot of good times in that cabin, lots of good memories, but there was this one recurring thing that happened that still makes me question the fabric of this reality. I know, you're probably thinking this all sounds very H.P. Lovecraft, but other than some kind of creature from another plane of existence, I have no explanation of what this thing was. To get things started, my sister and I would hear this tapping on our window all the time. It always happened around midnight. It didn't matter what day of the week it was or what season we were in. Sometimes it was just a very light knock that you could barely hear. And sometimes it was harder tapping, like something out there really wanted our attention. It went on for over a year before it was finally resolved. Neither of us ever looked out the window. Forget that. We were only kids and it was the middle of the night. And my parents actually witnessed it too, on more than one occasion. When it first started, we told our parents that there was a tapping on the glass, but since it was the middle of the night and it would literally wake us up, they just assumed one of us had either dreamt about it and the other one got excited, or that it was the wind making some of the bushes outside hit the glass on the window and we were just letting our imaginations get the best of us. Then one night, my mom actually heard it while she was in our room. 
and I forget why we were up so late on this occasion, but I remember her going quiet and listening to the tapping. It was very methodical. It wasn't the random tapping of a bush hitting our window from the wind. My mom was literally in mid-sentence when it happened, and she just stopped talking. This time, it was a sharp, hard tap, tap, tap on the window. She knew instantly that it wasn't the wind. She went to the window and looked out the curtains, but didn't see anything. She got my dad, and he went outside with a shotgun to investigate. We waited in the house for him. My mom and sister seemed scared, but I was actually excited. I wanted to know what had been causing the tapping that we'd been hearing for so long. At this point, it'd been going on for well over six months, maybe almost an entire year by this time. I don't really remember how long because I was so little back then, but I knew that it had already been occurring for a really long time. You can imagine my disappointment when my dad came back in and shrugged. He didn't find anything, and nothing was out of the ordinary either. He still thought it was the bushes tapping on the window, and my mom had just gotten spooked. We told them that it happened all the time, always around the same time, and they both had this concerning look on their face, and they were confused, but eventually we shrugged it off and went back to bed. I remember the very next day, my dad had set out some traps and made sure that both of us knew where they were. He stressed how important it was to leave them alone and that it was to catch whatever or whoever was knocking on the window. I know my mom had a big part in that. If she wanted something done, usually he just gave in and did it. I asked him what he thought it was, but he wasn't even sure himself. He just wanted to make sure that we were okay. I couldn't really tell if he was trying to get to the bottom of it because he believed something weird was going on, or if he really just did want to appease my mother. I know he stayed up late that night and told us if we heard anything, like the tapping, to come and get us. There wasn't any tapping that night, but sure enough, the next night, that tapping happened again. We woke my dad up and he went outside to look for the culprit. Not only did he not find anything, but all four traps were sprung, and there wasn't anything in any of them, and the bait was gone. He concluded that something really weird was going on, but he still just wasn't sure what it was. He had those traps out more than one night after that, and every night he'd come up empty-handed. Sometimes the traps would get sprung and the bait would be gone. Sometimes we'd hear the tapping on the window and the bait would still be in those traps and they wouldn't be touched. It was just the oddest thing and I knew that it was frustrating my dad. But still, it went on and on. A couple of times a week, no matter what, nothing was ever found. After another month or so, my dad actually heard it for himself a couple of times and he went out there. There'd still be no signs of anything out there at all. At this point, he wasn't just frustrated anymore, he was angry, and he was trying everything in his mind to figure out what was going on. He tried to recreate the noises, tried to catch whatever was doing it in the act, even stayed outside to try and figure out what was going on. But nothing answered our questions at all. It was like whatever was out there was just toying with my dad. On the nights that my dad would camp out there, there would be nothing at all. But the very next night that he would stay in the house, the tapping would come back. He'd run out there with his gun, stay out there for a long time, just searching our property and the surrounding area for anything that could be causing those noises. But it was always bubkiss. Until one night, when he finally got his answer. Usually. The knocking would happen once or twice, and then it would be done, but this night, it kept happening. It was like it would tap on our window, run off, come back to tap, and run off again. And it continued this way for a long time. My sister and I were both very scared at this point, and we told our dad what was going on. 
He went to our room where the lights were still off and waited to hear it again for himself. When he did, it was that slow, methodical tap, tap, tap. He ran out of the house, telling us he was going to get it this time. He was out there for a few minutes, but it felt like a lot longer. I remember my little brother was awake too, and at this point, he was already over a year old and moving around, so my mom was trying to contain him. I remember him getting fussy and me being afraid that whatever was out there would hear him and try to come in to get him. There were sounds of a commotion, my dad screaming and hollering in fright, this horrible scream from whatever was out there with him, and the sound of his shotgun discharging. Then he burst back into the house and slammed the door behind him. I had never seen him look so scared in my entire life. He was pale and sweaty and his eyes were huge. He looked absolutely terrified, which just terrified me. My mother kept yelling, asking what had happened, but my dad wouldn't answer. He just kept shaking his head no and muttering to himself. And then he was going from window to window and looking outside making sure we were all in the middle of the room and not next to any of the windows or doors. At this point, I wanted to cry because I was so scared and I could hear my sister trying to stifle her tears. My mom made my sister hold our baby brother and kept following my dad around, trying to get him to answer her. And then she told him he was hurt. I don't think he even noticed, or if he did, he had other things on his mind and was just blotting out the pain. But when I looked, she was right. There was an area in the back of his shirt that was ripped open, and it looked like he had a deep gash in his shoulder. There was a lot of blood, too. When he finally stopped moving around the house and looked at his wound himself, he told us that it was just a bear. My mom told him that he needed to sit down so she could patch him up and clean his wounds, and after a few minutes of him being stubborn and looking out the windows again, he finally listened to her. She told us to go to our room, but my dad said, no, keep them by us. Even then, as young as I was, I realized that it was a really odd thing to say if there was a bear outside. I mean, I understood that bears were dangerous and everything, but I just didn't know why he was this scared of a bear. It wasn't like we hadn't seen them before. We asked if he had shot the bear. He said he knows he made contact, but it ran off when it got hit. I watched my mom patch him up. I was still asking questions and being annoying. I was asking about how big the bear was and how it was tapping on the glass and if it had attacked my dad, but my mom shushed me and told me that I needed to be quiet. My dad was really agitated and didn't seem to want to answer any of the questions that I was asking him which just made us worry about him even more. Eventually, he made us all go to sleep, but we all had to sleep in the living room that night. That just confused me so much that I gave up asking questions. I didn't know why he was acting like this. It took me a couple hours to actually fall asleep, and the whole time I was awake, I watched my dad. He was standing at one of the windows, just staring outside. He had a shotgun next to him and a very serious look on his face. He kept clutching the necklace that he wore. He never took it off, in fact. It was a rosary. He just kept holding it and kissing it. I think he was even closing his eyes and praying, but if he was, he was doing it silently. After that night, though, the tapping stopped altogether. It never happened again after that night that my dad had his run-in with the bear, and I used quotation marks on the bear. He didn't let us go outside to play unless he was with us anymore either. That was the rule for over another year, until I guess he was comfortable enough to let us be alone again. Maybe he thought that his bear, or whatever it was, had run off or died because we never saw it again. But. He never talked about that night with us again either, until we were in our teen years. I know he'd still talk to my mother about it though, because when my sister or I would come into the room, 
They'd always have that same worried expression on their faces, and they would go really quiet. And it wasn't until years later that they actually told us what really happened. I was 12 when they finally decided that I was old enough to know, and we'd recently moved away from that area to be with my sick grandma. I really think the only reason they decided to tell us then was because they didn't need to worry about us being afraid of our own home now that we were six hours away from the spot where it happened. And I think they waited to tell my sister because she would have told me before they were ready for me to know. So they decided to just tell us both at once. What my dad said changed the way that I think of this world. He told us that the night that he was attacked, he'd gone outside and circled the house three times before he caught sight of what was tapping on the glass. The first three times, there were no signs of anything out there whatsoever, unless you count some nasty smell that he was talking about. Knowing what I do now, I believe it was the odor of the dog man that he was smelling. When he went around the corner to where our window was the fourth time, is when he saw what he could only comprehend at the time to be a werewolf. I remember when he told us that, I got goosebumps from my neck all the way down my entire back. My dad was a firm believer in Christ. He didn't think of things like werewolves or vampires or even aliens to be real. In fact, until then, I thought that he would call it blasphemy if you even said that they were real, but here he was, telling us that he ran into a werewolf all those years ago. He said this thing was actually looking into the window of our bedroom, and that its tongue was hanging out of its mouth like it was panting. The way he described it was something I can still remember vividly to this day. He said it was a couple feet taller than him, which would be at least eight feet tall. My dad's a big guy. It was covered from head to toe in thick, dark, clumpy fur, and it was standing up on two legs. The way it was standing made him think of a canine. He described it as backwards legs, but we all know that they actually stand on their toes, and that it's the hawk that's sticking back like that. He described the body type as being more muscular in the torso and shoulders, and more slender from the waist down. It looked kind of disproportionate to him, actually. When he first saw it, it had a paw up on the window, and it was trying to see into our room. He said the paw had prominent fingers and claws on the ends of those fingers. He thinks it was using those claws to make the tapping noise on the glass. And when he shined his light at it, it turned and growled at him. He saw huge fangs in its mouth, and the eyes reflected the light like a cat, but they were more of a bright yellow color. He said it had a long muzzle and big canine ears, and hair towards the back of its head that was longer. When he first saw it, he was so shocked that he started yelling, and that's when this thing lunged at him. He said he turned to run, and that's when he felt that thing make contact with him, and he felt a tugging on his shirt. He thinks that's when the shirt ripped and his shoulder got hurt. He really thought he was going to die that night, but he was able to break free, thank God. He got to a spot where he could take a good shot, and he fired a shotgun. When the shot hit this creature, it staggered back, but didn't even seem to be in too much pain. What kind of creature can take a shotgun blast like that? I mean, he wasn't point blank or anything, but I'm assuming that if a natural creature got hit with a shotgun blast, it would do a lot more damage than it did to this thing. Even so, he says that's when it let out that horrible, wild scream. Now, I heard that scream. It was primal and unnatural, and unlike anything I have ever heard in my entire life. It sounded angry, but not just an irritated kind of angry. An angry like you're seeing red, and you just want to rip apart something to quell that anger. I can't even imagine what it was like being right there in front of that thing when it made that horrible scream. The creature, and by the way, that's the only thing my dad ever refers to it by, even to this day. The creature spun around, dropped to all fours, and bounded away into the trees. It looked back at my dad once and then kept going. 
He said it was so fast, it cleared our whole yard in just a couple of seconds. Big, long strides. And that's when he ran back into the house all freaked out. I firmly believe he saw a dog man that night. And I believe all the times it was tapping on the glass was to try to lure us out there. I have no idea what it would have done to us, but I don't think it would have been good. From my dad's description, it was a lethal killing machine, and it seemed very angry. I'm really glad that my sister and I never had the guts to look out of the window. I'm glad that neither of us ever had to witness the creature like my dad did, because honestly, I'm not sure that I could have even handled it like he did. Thanks for taking the time to read this on your channel. I think you're great. Sincerely, William. I have never told this story to anyone, and I must assure you that it's true. Let me give you a little background on me first. I'm a retired, decorated police officer with over 30 years of law enforcement service, and now I'm an Orthodox Angelican priest. My story starts in June 2014. My wife was taking my son and daughter to go visit my sister-in-law, and she knew that I'd be bored if I went with her. so. She suggested I go on an outing with one of my friends so I could get out of the house and have some fun. I contacted my friend Ron, who was also a retired police officer, and asked him if he wanted to go camping and hiking. Ron was in and we loaded up the truck and went into the Santa Cruz Mountains in California. We set up camp in an area that Ron knew well. He told me that there was a pond east of the camp and that wildlife gathered there to drink. I took my field glasses and started hiking up the trail to get to the pond area. It was about 6.30 p.m. and it was starting to turn to dusk. As I hiked up the trail, I observed a meadow down the hill from me to the north. I noticed some movement in the meadow and took out my field glasses and looked down into it. What I saw shocked me. I saw a large mule deer that had been taken down and two wolves were feasting on the carcass. But then I realized there are no wolves in California. But there they were, two very large black wolves eating a deer. Now I've been a hunter, outdoorsman, and hiker all of my life. I know what the animals of the forest look like. These were wolves, the largest ones that I've ever seen. Their heads were huge. They both had silver-tipped black fur all over their bodies and large black bushy tails. As they feed on this deer, I could see the blood of the deer on their muzzles. I walked a little to my left and positioned myself behind a pine tree, making sure that I was out of sight. When I did, I stepped on a branch and heard a loud crack. This alerted the creatures, and they looked over towards my direction. Then, to my horror, one of them stood up on its hind legs and started sniffing the air. It stood about seven feet tall. The eyes shone amber color, and I could hear it growling. This creature did not have canine-type legs, but man-like legs. They were huge and muscular. It also had a large, broad chest and man-like front arms. It did not have paws, but large man-like hands that had claws coming out of the ends of the fingers. These were no wolves. They weren't dogmen. They were werewolves. I stood there, transfixed behind the tree, and I was scared. I'm not scared of much. But this scared the crap out of me. The hair in my arms and the back of my neck stood straight up. I heard Ron coming up behind me on the trail, and I told him to be as quiet as possible and look down into the meadow below. He looked down, and with his field glasses on too, he said, What in the hell is that? I told him, What do you think it is? That's a couple of werewolves. They took down that deer buck, and they were eating it when I came along. One of the werewolves was still standing there, looking in our direction. 
He then took two steps towards us and was baring his teeth and growling. I took my off-duty weapon out and put it down next to my right side. Ron did the same thing. I think that's when the creatures homed in on us and looked directly at me and Ron. I raised my pistol to the ready position and Ron did the same thing. I told him, if he takes one more step towards us, then we light him up. Ron nodded. For some reason, they didn't approach us any further. They just growled and kept staring at us. All of a sudden, they turned their heads westward and then got on all fours and ran across the meadow, back into the forest, and out of sight. We lowered our pistols. Ron looked at me. I don't know about you, but let's get the hell out of here. I fully agreed, and we ran back to camp packed up as quick as possible and got out of there. We then heard a loud wolf howl from the forest as we drove off out of sight. This is the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. We didn't tell anyone our story because we thought people would think we were nuts. But after reading books about Dogman and David Politis 411 books, I decided to tell you this story. Ron has passed away since then. We were the only two that knew about this. This isn't the first time I've seen strange creatures in my life. I think it's my Cherokee and Celtic blood that makes me more in tune to see these creatures. I don't know, it's just a theory. But be warned, do not go into the woods alone. Always carry a firearm. Carry a GPS rescue beacon and always tell someone where you are and when you'll be back. These things are a must. Do not go looking for these creatures. Good evening, Creatures of the Night. I poured my heart and soul into this book, and I hope that you guys enjoy it as much as I enjoy writing it. Being an author has been my dream since I was little. This book is so important to me. I hope that you guys just really delve into it and sink your teeth into it. So I'm going to present one of the chapters. I'm going to read a little preview. It doesn't spoil the plot. But hopefully it's written well enough and it's interesting enough for you guys to get hooked on it and want to know more about the story. The link to the Amazon account to get that is in the description down below. So without further ado, here is a chapter to sink your teeth into and I hope you enjoy The Griffin Chronicles, Volume 1, Chosen. Down the shore from the boardwalk, two college students sit and watch the waves crash onto the beach. They're from out of town and spending the last remaining evening in the cove before heading back to the Bay Area. The girl stares out at the ocean and eyes an old abandoned mansion that sits on an island about a mile offshore. The mansion once belonged to the first mayor of October's Cove, Wilkins Groiner. He had it built in 1885 and lived there with his wife until the day they both disappeared. Neither of them were ever found. The authorities assumed that they had drowned in the surf and their bodies were washed out to the bay. No one else ever lived in the house, despite its size and location. There were rumors circulating about opening it as a historical museum, but the funding fell through and it was only partially restored. That was 30 years ago. Now the mansion just sits and rots away on the harsh salt air. But once in a while the ghost stories surface again. Stories of lights and sounds coming from the Groiner mansion. But those stories have been disputed by Sheriff Barr and Deputy Tonks especially after the disappearances last summer. It seems every year people go missing during the summer months. Since then, the mansion has been classified as restricted because of safety concerns. No one is allowed to venture into the house anymore. It's really nice here, the girl says as she snuggles up to her boyfriend, still staring out at the mansion. He sips a beer and nods at her, highly intoxicated. Yeah, but I heard once the summer's over, this town kind of sucks. I also heard this weird guy talking about how there was a couple of missing people last summer. Some out-of-towners. They said they were going out to the mansion and then they just... disappeared. She looks up at him as a chill runs down her spine. What happened to them? He makes a throat-cutting motion at her and tries to scare her. She pushes him away, irritated. Knock it off, Bob. Seriously, what happened to them? Bob shrugs, belches, and continues to drink his beer. Drown? Fell through a floor and got impaled? Got eaten by a ghost? Who knows? 
I heard they searched the area but never found them. The more important question is, where can I pee? He laughs and stands up, walking away for some privacy. She looks out at the mansion again and shudders. Want to go for a swim, she calls to him. As he relieves himself, he starts laughing. Why, so you can get eaten by a shark while I pass it on the beach? Maybe we can sneak out there and catch a ghost on film or whatever. Make some money off it. He doesn't hear a response. Babe? Babe? Linda? He turns around, unsteady on his feet, and stumbles back to where they were just sitting. Linda is nowhere to be found. He looks around confused. Hey Linda, if you're trying to scare me because of that stupid house out there, it isn't going to work. He staggers back and turns around, and a man with a scruffy beard and shoulder length hair stares back at him. Hey there, you looking for someone? The man asks calmly with a southern accent. He smiles politely at Bob, seemingly interested in his response. Bob looks around again, confused and drunk. I was here with my girlfriend, Linda. I went off to take a leak and now I can't find her. Bob stumbles again and the man grabs his arm to steady him. Bob squints at him, trying to adjust his sight through his intoxication. Where did you come from? It's like you just appeared out of nowhere. The man chuckles and looks away, then returns his gaze with more intensity. Now that's just weird. Your girlfriend just disappearing and me just appearing? He looks up quickly, like he's just seen something. What was that? Bob turns around, unsteady, looking in the direction that the man did. But there's nothing there. What was what, he asks as he continues to look. When he doesn't get a reply, he turns back around. But the man is nowhere to be found. What the hell is going on, Bob mumbles. Hey you, someone whispers from above him. He quickly looks up and his face contorts in horror. He screams and tries to back away but falls into the sand. He tries to scoot back but the man floats down over him, grabs him, and floats up into the air again. Bob screams for help but the man covers his mouth. What's wrong? I thought you wanted to see Linda again, the man whispers. Then his face contorts into something monstrous. His eyes turn black as a shark's. His forehead hangs low over his eyes and his skin pales to the gray of a corpse. Small dark veins run through his face and his jaw elongates, exposing a set of long, deadly canine teeth that glisten in the moonlight. Bob screams even harder, but his screams are muffled through the vampire's hand. The vampire laughs and snaps his head forward, sinking his teeth into Bob's neck. The vampire releases his bite as blood gushes from Bob's neck. The vampire laughs as the blood squirts onto his face and shirt. The blood begins to stain Bob's shirt, and he starts to fade into a blissful unconsciousness. It doesn't hurt anymore. The vampire leans in and drinks deep from Bob's neck, slowly floating down to the ground again, taking the time to drain Bob's life away. By the time the vampire lands in the sand, Bob is limp in his arms. The vampire continues to drink until Bob's heart stops. He slowly raises his head and takes a deep euphoric breath as the bloodlust calms down. He lets Bob's body slip from his arms and fall onto the bloodstained sand. He looks down and wipes his mouth with the back of his arm. Ah, Bane, now we're going to have to clean this up, an Englishwoman says as she slowly and gracefully comes up to him. She too has a mouth covered in blood, although she has already transformed back into her human visage. Her name is Diana, and she's been a vampire for a very long time. She looks down at the body, amused. You're such a slob, she says slowly as she runs her thumb over his lips, wiping the leftover blood from them, and places her thumb into her mouth. This one was so drunk I can taste it. Bane chuckles. Why do you think I picked him? I like the buzz. We can just take them back to the island and toss them in the water. The currents will do the rest. Diana nods at him, the edges of her blood-stained mouth curving up into a smile. I forgot how much I love this town, Bane says. More drunk, corny partiers than I can eat. Diana nods. At least during the summer. After that, we have to get takeout. But there are other towns around here that we can go to. Don't forget what Vince always says about feeding in the town you're in. Something about a frog in a pond, right? Bane smirks at her. Apart from hunting and killing, Bane's greatest pleasure is getting under people's skin, no matter who they are. That's why he chose the name Bane, after all. Diana scowls at him. The frog doesn't drink up the pond where it lives. Bane smirks again. Yeah, that. 
That ain't why we're here anyways, now is it? He asks her. Diana nods and smiles, closing her eyes. The Witch's Gate. I can already feel its power. Can't you? Bane nods with a wicked smile as Diana looks down at Bob's corpse. We should be off. Vince will be waiting for us. You grab him. I'll grab the other one. So there you have it. Hopefully that piqued your interest and you'll want to read the rest of the story. Because I've been planning this book for a very long time and this isn't the only story that I have to tell. So hopefully you can join my cast of characters in all of their adventures. That's all I got for you guys tonight. Nighty night, creatures of the night. And remember, as always, don't miss your chance to scream. <laughs>